Well, thanks for watching Open Life uh, Online. We're jumping into a new series today and I am excited that you've joined us. Make sure that you fill out the Connect card. Uh, let us know what's going on. Send us a comment, prayer request. We'd be honored to pray with you and uh, just walk along with you whatever you are going through this summer. But we're jumping into a summer series. So follow along on the fill-in and grow along with us in your relationship with Jesus this summer. Here's the series. We're gonna be looking at Hebrews 11 and just the first three verses of Hebrews 12. And uh, let me ask you some questions, like what kind of individual does God choose to exemplify faith for us? Um, what does running the race of life and faith look like? There's our little nod to the Olympics this summer, right? Uh, it, you'll, I'll read it in a second. Uh, but in Hebrews 11, we get a glimpse into what the author refers to as the ancients. You'll know like Noah, David, Samson, uh, Rahab, just a bunch of uh, those who are commended for their faith inside this section of scripture. And these ancient people recorded with their imperfections serve as powerful example of walking with God in faith. Um, they were not flawless, like uh, uh, <laughs> rather they were imperfect and yet possessed enough faith for God to, to testify about them, to, to showcase them, if you will, as timeless examples of faith. And, and so in this year's summer series, we're calling it By Faith, uh, we'll unpack all of the lives contained inside of these scriptures, uh, uh, the, the ancients, if you will. And we're gonna embrace their flawed realities and explore how their By Faith moments established a path for our own journey of faith, which will allow us to unlock the door to a more abundant life. That's why God gives us his scripture, to equip us, to rebuke us, to challenge us, as we'll read in a moment. Let's jump right in. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna read the beginning and the end because I'm not gonna dive into the, all the by faiths in the middle of all the characters because we're gonna unpack each of them as the weeks go on throughout the summer. So verse one, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. Now let's jump past all the other by faiths and find ourselves in verse 39. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Jesus is the nod there. Uh, verse one of Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders the sin that so entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer, the perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, uh, scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Wow. So today we just dive right into this book of Hebrews and uh, we get a quick intro of the book of Hebrews. This is often referred to Hebrews 11 as the hall of faith or the hall of fame of those who have faith. Um, and uh, so we'll need a bit of context here in a second. We're gonna explore what is being spoken of here as faith. What are the elements of faith contained in this? And then finally, we're gonna jump into that first example we read in verse four of Abel. Like what's this story of Abel? Uh, if we're unfamiliar and even familiar, maybe something will jump out and then uh, there's a ton to unpack. So let me give you the big idea today. The faith of the ancients still speak to us today. Like this still speaks to us, encourages us 
today. Okay, now the author of Hebrews, we have to know the context of this. Unknown, uh, there's been assumptions that it's Barnabas or it's Paul or it's Apollos, but it's literally unknown. Um, But this author had a firsthand knowledge of the apostles. Uh, This author was writing to an audience that he pre-assumed had really really good knowledge of Old Testament scriptures because just assuming they knew the story of Cain and Abel or Abraham or the nation of Israel, Moses, the commandments, priests, tabernacles, sacrifices, the wilderness, the promised land, you know, just there was this pre-assumed knowledge which will make us dive in to to make sure we know what is being talked about. We're gonna look back um, and learn glean, if you will. But the goals of the text are pretty pretty uh, uh, blatant to elevate Jesus. Um, like we have something better, like they did this by faith, but we have Jesus. Um, he is worthy of our trust, worthy of our, our worship, our, our, our offering. Uh, God is faithful is another theme that you can see, like he'll do what he has promised. And in turn, we should remain faithful, endure. They were battling persecution uh, and the author was trying to encourage them. Hey, Jesus endured to the cross so you can do it. You can make it. And uh, the audience was experienced this, experiencing persecution and so they were being encouraged. So we don't know the author. How did this end up in our text? Like, is, is it still valid scripture? Absolutely. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says this, all scriptures God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. God put this here so that we could be encouraged and equipped and we get this, this quick glimpse into this whole book of Hebrews, but we're really zooming in on Hebrews 11 and the first three verses of Hebrews 12. Uh, God wants us not to ignore the flaws uh, and, and, and I believe elevates some of the, the ancients that had flaws so that we could see their moments of faith and be inspired. Like he's still in the business of using broken people for great things and should be an encouragement to us that we can be equipped. So the faith of the ancients still speak to us today. Let's jump into thought one. Only two thoughts today to keep it simple. Faith, right? Thought one, faith is commendable. We see this word in there that we'll dive into a little more here in a second. But the ancients are these amazing biblical accounts of people like Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Rahab, Samson, David, just a ton of them uh, that are, were all commended for their faith. They were witnesses, as we saw there in that, uh, uh, the conclusion of this section. They were witnesses of the faith. Uh, and God is witnessing of their, about their faith. But these witnesses of that faith were far from perfect. I mean, David... It was an adulterer. He had somebody killed, but he was a man after God's own heart, right? Samson, I don't think we want to raise our children having his relational strategies. You know, there's all kinds of stuff we see in here, but there's faith moments that God honors. So how do we pull these out and learn from them? So faith, what's this faith? Uh, it's a confidence in what is hoped for, we're told in the first verse, an assurance of what is yet to be visibly seen. Um, and this faith is a, a perspective. It's a way of seeing even creation from its beginning, and we're told. Listen to this quote uh, from Wearsby in the Bible Ex- Exposition Commentary. I, I really liked it, so I want to read both the segments here. It says, this is not a definition of faith, but a description of what faith does and how it works. True Bible faith is not blind optimism or a manufactured hope so feeling. Neither is it an intellectual assent to a doctrine. It is certainly not believing in spite of evidence. 
that would be superstition. True Bible faith is confident obedience to God's word in spite of circumstances and consequences. And then he challenges us to read it again, so I'll do it. Confident obedience to God's word in spite of circumstances and coincidences. This faith operates quite simply. God speaks, we hear his word, we trust his word and act on it no matter what the circumstances are or what the consequences may be. The circumstances may be impossible and the consequences frightening and unknown, but we obey God's word just the same and believe him to do what is right and what is best. Holy moly, that is rich. That's why I wanted to put that in your notes. Hope you were using the fill in. Okay, here's three key words used in this in these verses about faith, confidence. Uh, this literally means foundation or to stand under. Remember when scripture tells us we will not be tempted besides that which we can stand up under. It's this, it's this uh, confidence, this protection, this support. Um, faith is to a Christian as a foundation is to a house. It's that, that steadiness. Um, Hebrews 4.16 says this, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We can go directly to God with confidence. So faith has this element, this practice of confidence. Like I'm confident I can approach God. Okay, assurance is another word here. Uh, when we walk in faith, we have confidence and assurance. <laughs> this is... Uh, like what God promises, he performs. We just, we can be assured in it because we have such a rich history of witnesses. And that's what Hebrews 11 is just gonna walk through to boost our assurance, to boost our confidence. Um, and, and so this is, this is a faith we only experience after making a decision to follow Jesus for us, right? Like, not, it, that's why it's saying we have something greater and like we have something more abundant now. This is great news that we can put our faith in Jesus and the work he did on the cross. We don't have to just blindly step out as those who can't see yet um, as the testimony of those by faith experienced. Listen to Hebrews 10, 22. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart with a full assurance that faith brings having our hearts sprinkled to clean to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water so again just this encouragement of our assurance that we have in our faith um, and then finally commendation or if you're reading the king james version witness uh, so commendation this this commending this appreciation, this rewarding. Um, this word occurs throughout Hebrews 11, uh, but throughout the scripture, used multiple times here, even as a great cl cloud of witnesses testifying uh, with, their, with their actions, that they did do what God said to do, and, and it proved true. So their actions actually became a, a commendation of God, and then God spoke in all these by faith scenarios, God spoke well of the person. He gave them a commendation. Uh, this commendation is a shout out in both ways. The lifestyle and actions gave God a shout out. God gives them a shout out. So our next thought talks about this reality um, because it's exactly what he did about uh, with, with Abel's offering. Here's thought two, faith is worth the price of perseverance. Hebrews 11.4 says, again, we, I just want you to hear this again before we jump into it. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended, there it is again, as righteous when God spoke well, so again, a commendation of his offerings. 
And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. Now again, context to Hebrews, they're experiencing persecution. So they're saying, even though you face, the author's encouraging, even though you face persecution for your faith, um, your witness will continue even if your conclusion of witness is martyrdom. Death is not the end of your story. Uh, and there's other parts within the testimony of, of Cain and Abel. Sin will always be looking to, to take us out through others. That's just a reality. So we can't let that paralyze us. We should persevere with that knowledge and continue living life as an offering to God. And so right from the get-go to encourage this perseverance, God shares the faith story of Abel. And Abel's our first martyr in the scriptures. Let's go to Genesis 4, 1 through 12. Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry. His face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. So, so there's a chance, right, to rule over the sin. Uh, there's a promise that your offering can be accepted. Verse 8, Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where's your brother? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Man, such a brutal story. King gets all the press here, doesn't he? But yet... God's pointing us here for the sake of, by faith, what Abel did. Um, there's underlying theme throughout Hebrews of enduring persecution, persevering through trial, and Abel is an image of the first martyr who was martyred out of jealousy of his worship. And we're not told verbatim why Abel's worship and offering were looked upon with more favor over Cain's, uh, but we're told Cain understood why, right? In that very language, do what is right. He understood that what he was doing was not right. But this is before any offering laws. This is before anything's written down. Again, this is the second generation. And uh, watching one of the Bible Project lessons, actually two different class lessons on this, was really interesting to see the parallels that are going on here in between Adam and Eve's moment with God in the garden and their falling temptation to, to, to evil and, and longing for the knowledge of God and getting cast out of the garden. And now Cain, is this next generation, is experiencing temptation. And how is the next generation going to deal with temptation? And, and Cain falls to temptation. And, and does evil, kills his brother. So this moment is the next generation's turn and Cain sins and actually is cast even farther out. He's gonna become a wanderer. His discipline is what he says more than he can handle. But God's like, not true. You're, you can handle this. You can read on and, and see how things play out. So maybe Abel's offering 
uh, was more pleasing because he brought the fat portions. We get a lot of description of Abel's offering. He brought the fat portions of the firstborn. Um, so this is kind of that first fruits concept we see actually put into uh, law, into encouragement later of bring your first fruits to the house. To And the reality is Abel set the bar. Like he's the one who did it. He brought his first fruit, the fatted, the fat burnt as an offering uh, later on in the Old Testament started here before God ever commanded it. And Cain, on the other hand, he just brings a portion. He brings something. It doesn't say that it's his first fruits. It doesn't say that it's the best portion, the fat portions that Abel brought. Uh, took time and focus and care. Uh, they were selected. It was the most choice selection where it, Cain just brings some of his harvest. And, and so I think it's really intriguing to look and ask ourselves some of the questions of, is this like the root of even the encouragement of our generosity? Uh, maybe Cain was just bringing it he was tipping instead of tithing, you could say, to God. He wasn't rejected, though. Um, he, he just wasn't affirmed with the same look God gave Abel in that rose in him a jealousy that turned into anger and being downcast. And uh, so this is where we get our warning <laughs> like God tries to express this clearly to Cain um, that this isn't the end of life, just that this offering wasn't looked upon with the same favor Abel's was. You know to do what is right. So, uh, but yet he warns him in this moment, when you're angry, do not sin, right? Which we're commanded in scripture, in your anger, do not sin, right? So he's like, sin is crouching at the door and anger wants Cain and yet God promises Cain that he must rule over this temptation and he wouldn't give a promise that he wouldn't fulfill. Uh, so Cain has this option, but the evil within him, that sin lured him. So our promise is that we can overcome our anger. We can overcome our disappointments, our downcast spirit. We can overcome the enemy and we can lean in on God's nature and reality that he says, uh, if we do what is right, we'll be lifted out of this. That's presented here. Okay, so in Cain and Abel's story, Cain gets pretty much all the press again. We're reading about his consequences but in Hebrews 11, it's, it's Abel. And uh, Hebrews 12, 1 again says, therefore, since we, have, uh, we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so entangles. That could be a nod back to Cain. Reality is sin entangles and entraps, and that's what happened to Cain. And so we need to ask our own lives. We need to kind of do a self-inspection and challenge ours. How is our offering to the Lord? How is our worship unto the Lord? Um, what are we bringing him from our fruits and from the fruits he's blessed us with? 100% of what we experience is from him. And are we giving him thanks for it? Are we bringing it back unto him? Uh, maybe we should be more thoughtful. Maybe we should give the the best portions. Maybe we should be bringing the the fat portions, you know, or the first fruits as scripture challenges us. And this is where the whole concept of tithing gets birthed is in the first fruits. God just puts a percentage to it later of 10% of the first fruits. So when we look at generosity or giving and tithing, where is our heart? Are we experiencing this, this favor from God? because we're being faithfully generous and we're giving him our first fruits? Or do we feel the look Cain was receiving? Do we have disappointment in our offering? God's telling us, you can change this. You can change it. Let's take a step of faith. Let's grow in our generosity. Which direction is the arrow 
of our generosity going towards Abel or towards Cain? That's a tough thing to process, but one we're encouraged to process today. And we could heed the warning to watch out for the entanglement of sin that is crouching at the door. Such an ominous imagery we're giving. We're always susceptible to the temptations of the enemy the same as Cain. First John 3 verse 10 says this, this is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. <laughs> oh my goodness. Cain gives in to the desire of sin and kills his brother. And it says the evil was with him, right? Just that sin character in, in Genesis is just... Cain gives in the same as Adam and Eve gave in to the temptation of the fruit. So uh, giving us the first martyr of scripture as our by faith example in Hebrews 11, 4, he gives us a promise in the midst of that, that if martyrdom is our end as well, our message is gonna live on beyond our time. That's the, that's the reality of martyrs. When we're martyred for our faith, we continue to speak our witness, our commendation for the rest of time. It's a nod to the promise to the recipients of this letter and the Hebrew church that's being persecuted. Even if the end of your life is martyrdom, stay the course, be a faithful witness, carry on, persevere, do not lose heart. Here's our action point today. Listen to the witness of the ancients and put your faith in Jesus. We have something greater than all these examples by faith that we're gonna look at in Hebrews 11. We have something greater. We know Jesus was the son of God and that he went to the cross and he gave his life for our sin. He rose three days later. He's given us the Holy Spirit to help us do what God wants us to do so we aren't lured in and entangled by the enemy. And so we have this opportunity to put our faith in Jesus and live this abundant life to run the race that's been set out for us. And I wanna pray that over you, that we would lean into faith in Jesus, listen to these witnesses and just be encouraged by the opportunity we have today to live by faith as well. God, I thank you for the opportunity we have to open up your word and, and look back at stories from the Old Testament as the author calls them the ancients. These ancients teach us so many things and the Abel and Cain story shows us an acceptable offering, one of the fat portions of the first born and it's this, this heart of surrender, this imagery that in the future leads to a challenge of tithing and, and being generous and, and receiving blessing from you in abundance and I just pray that God, we would be challenged by his offering. May we experience you looking upon us with favor. And God, Cain was lured and enticed and, and, and gave in to evil, um, birthed out of that anger and disappointment that he experienced. But yet, he was told he could overcome it. And I just pray that God, if we're experiencing anger or disappointment today, that we would put our faith in you afresh and be able to overcome this anger and, and that we've somehow become entangled with and we would realign which is what you do you take our weaknesses and you make them strong by the power of your holy spirit may you realign our hearts may we once again worship you bring you our best offering our best gift of worship our life may we lay before you and may we experience a fresh transformation through faith in jesus today i just give you thanks for your word what you're showing us in Hebrews 11 this summer of what is possible by faith and the challenges of what it points us towards to be able to live an abundant life as we 
pursue the path that you have carved out for us. We just give you praise, Jesus. In your name, amen. Amen. We look forward to seeing you next week. God bless. Well, I hope you were encouraged and challenged by today's message. Uh, at the end of our service, we always want to just take time, one last opportunity for you to fill out the Connect card. Let us know you have watched and engaged with today's service. Let us know how we can be praying for you this week by filling out one of those Connect cards. And it's also the time where we talk about your giving and generosity to Open Life Church. Each Sunday, it, whenever anyone gives to Open Life, we are sure to give the first 10% to go towards what we call strategic generosity. We're trying to help people where they're hurting in their lives related to the issues that involve hunger, uh, education, foster care, relief work, justice for the oppressed, and reaching those who don't know Jesus with the gospel. And, and so we're uh, just excited to do that on a continual basis as part of our budgetary constraints that we put ourselves in as a church and community. And so we uh, are just excited to talk about those things on a monthly basis. But for the month of June, we're actually gonna be looking at the 90% of where your giving goes towards. So this will go towards things such as um, staff wages, as well as um, operational costs involving the rental of both the high school performing arts center on a week to week basis, as well as the gathering place and our mortgage that we pay on that. And, and so there are so many different things that go into it. But one of those uh, things that your money is go, goes towards is our regular ministry costs. And so these help funds our kids life ministries, our student life ministries, our worship ministries, uh, and, and another one is outreach. And, and so we give uh, on a monthly basis into our uh, outreach fund to go towards opportunities we have to outreach to the community. And one of the things that has happened over the last year is uh, an outreach to the Prairie Ridge community called Kids Connect. It's been led by Fran um, under the leadership of Stephanie as well. And so they have done an incredible job with an incredible team that have uh, throughout the school year uh, been offering a time for for moms and caregivers of young kids to go meet at the Prairie Ridge Community Center on Fridays and just have a time to connect and for kids to learn and play together and have fun. And so uh, we made the decision at the turn of the new year to actually create a new uh, ministry fund for Kids Connect specifically. And so we're continuing to uh, fund that on a month to month basis. And so we're just so excited for what they're doing. And so we're only able to do things like that uh, because of your generosity. It helps us pay for our staff and wages. It helps us pay for uh, the operational costs, things like our app and website and stuff like that. And it does so much more and also gives us uh, opportunities to outreach uh, our community, even when it's outside of our normal strategic generosity window and the things that we talk about there. So thank you so much for your generosity. You know, it says in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, it says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap gener generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all, all that you need, you will abound in every good work. And so we just want to thank you for your generosity and what you have chosen to give to Open Life and help us to do what we do on a week-to-week -week basis here in Bonnie Lake, but also for the great things that we get to do across our community and around the world. So I hope you have a wonderful week. Thank you so much for joining us all the way to the end of today's service. And I can't wait to see you next Sunday, wherever you're watching right now. Have a great week and we'll see you soon.